I want to pose a question. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10, we read, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Now, I want to ask you a question. On its face, it seems as though this might be a, a weakness. It's an easy thing. This is an easy statement to deconstruct, right? That if you faint in a day of adversity, if you fall on when it gets a little hard, then you've got, you're, you're weak. You're weak in a place that would normally, if you had strength, you wouldn't faint. That's a pretty easy way of thinking about this. But thinking deeper and thinking about some things that I'm kind of going through right now as God is deconstructing and reconstructing me in another way. Is the loss, is the fainting good? Can it be good to faint in a day of adversity in order to uncover where you're weak? If God in, in Psalms 84 tells us that he will not withhold any good thing for those who walk uprightly, can adversity can fainting, can being weak in a situation be good? And that's the question. I was thinking as, uh, as I've been kind of pondering and meditating and praying on some things that have happened to me this week. I was asked the question, and it was in my heart. My heart asked the question. And it's quite possible the Spirit of God asked the question so that I could stand and, th and think about it and realize that God is doing something amazing in my life, even if it's against my better, my better, my wants and my desires. The question is, what do I become when I can't be what I was? What do I become? when I can't be what I was. A little backstory. This week, and as all of you know, I've been injured. I retired from police work, not because I wanted to, but because I was forced out due to injury. Then more, another medical condition kind of happened and it removed me from the security team at church. And then this last week, the church um, security director wanted to ask me for the key that I have that had a pretty decent amount of accessibility around the church. It allowed me to open up rooms for people who needed it. If I was in the building, it allowed me to get to places that I needed to go. But because I'm not on the security team anymore, they took that key away and they gave me a key that opens only... A few things. Well, I, I'm not on the team. And, and in a general census here, I don't need access to the building. I don't want it. But it had a curious effect on my heart. Because it was yet another place where they had, I had been reduced. I had started in a police department wanting to be the best of the best on the SWAT team, but that didn't happen. It reduced me. Then I got hurt of being a police officer and had to retire. And that hero mentality that I carry, that protector mentality in my heart that I hold, it got reduced. And then when my ear stopped working and I couldn't, I couldn't use a a radio and I had to go on blood thinners for blood clotting and some other things that are going on. I had to step down from the security team a little bit lesser, but still that heart to protect. <sighs> I got reduced again. And now this key is taken away. And the key was just a symbol. It's a symbol that I've been reduced even more. And what am I doing? It sure feels like God is reducing me to the sticks. It's a 
term for uh, in the house, right? If I take all the drywall down, behind it is kind of the scaffolding of the house. If you reduce me down to the very bottom of itself, I, I'm certainly feeling like I'm living this life in uh, that we read about in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. And then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, and so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look at the clay in the potter's hand, and so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster and I thought to bring upon it. In the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, well then I will relent concerning the good which I have said I would benefit of it. He, Jeremiah goes down and he sees the potter and the potter is making something at the wheel. He's building a pot, you know, and you got the spinning table and your wet hands and wet clay and it starts to mold and shape and round out beautifully. But it says as he's making this vessel that it gets marred, it gets destroyed, it gets decrepit. It doesn't hold its shape. And so it says the potter has to make it again. Which you have to believe is, is that he just smashed the clay back into its own starting form and start to work again. And, and in the way that he, it's being said here that he created it into another vessel, another shape, another something that he felt that it was good for him to make. And God is making this idea that it's like, look, I've made you a certain way, but at some point I may need to tear you down and and, and, and to build you back up in another way. For 18 years, I was trained in firearms and being protector and doing all these things, a, a real life portrayal of a superhero. And if you know me, I like superheroes because I got as close as I could to be one, somebody who stands for truth and justice in the American way. But God has slowly been bringing me to a point where I can't do that anymore. I have to have a different heart. God is changing me for some other purpose. And every time I think I've stopped so that I can hold on to a little bit of that past, he lessens me again. And we feel that way in this story about Joseph. I was thinking in, about Moses and about Joseph, how they were in one place doing one thing, and then all of a sudden God had to make a massive change in their personality, in their circumstances, in their situation, so that he could then build them up, take all of that clay, and start to roll it back into a vessel that seems good to him. Moses was the leader of Egypt, or the second in control of Egypt. He goes out, he kills that Egyptian and they everybody finds out he has to run into the desert for 40 years and tend sheep. Gosh, what a change to go from somebody who's walking in the courts uh, of of uh, of Pharaoh's palace and then he becomes a shepherd at the backside of the desert in Midian and then God calls him. By the way, this was interesting in Exodus chapter chapter uh, three, when Moses comes to this burning bush, I didn't even make this, I didn't make this connection. But every time I read this story, I see something just a little bit different as the words matter in the Bible. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. 
So Moses looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Moses sees something that's out of character. It's out of sort. Now, no doubt, he's on the backside of the desert. It's hot. If a flash storm comes in, some electrical storm, he's probably seen fires before. He probably uses fires to keep himself warm in the middle of the night. And he sees this bush, it's burning, but it's not burning. It says, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. He sees something out of the ordinary. And instead of blowing it off and walking by, he notices that something is amiss. Something is different. And it catches his eye. And he says, you know what? I got to go check this out. Why is this happening? Look at verse 4. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Now, there's no adjectives in this story. Do you think Moses just generally said, here I am? The bush is talking to him in a fire of something that doesn't make sense. And he hears the audible voice of the angel of God. That's the angel of the Lord. That's Jesus incarnate. That's a Christophany, a, an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and Moses simply says, here I am. I wonder how that discussion seems to go. But the point I want to make here is, is that it is God who calls us to ourself, to himself, right? He says, I'm going to show this, I'm going to put up this bush and I'm going to light it on fire, but it's not going to be consumed. Moses has a choice. Does he blow it off because it's just another bush and he doesn't care? Or does he notice that something's a little bit amiss and he's going to go and check it out? And when he stands in faith to check it out, God calls to him from the bush. This is no different than Jesus saying, do you want to be made well? Then stand up. It's no different than the, than the man with the withered hand standing at the back of the synagogue or the, the, uh, when Jesus says, step up here in front of everybody and step up here and reach out your hand. Now he could have said, no, you're crazy, but he didn't. By faith, he steps up and he reaches out his hand, his heel. The man at, 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 the, at Bethesda, he needs to get into the water. But Jesus says, take up your mat and walk. He hadn't been able to walk for 40 some years. He could have said, forget you. You don't know what you're talking about. God works this way in our life. Keep an eye open for the things that are out of the ordinary. Because it's out of the ordinary that catches our eyes. And when we want to look into it, God uses those opportunities to change things in our life. Romans chapter 2 tells us that it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Not the finger pointing, not the fire and brimstone, not that. It's the goodness. When you realize that there's something about God, something about your situation that has some sort of goodness and you don't understand it, it draws us closer to God. And it is God's goodness that leads us to turning to him. God calls us from the burning bush. Are you listening to his voice? Are you seeing the supernatural around you? And are you inquiring of God why that's happening? But anyway, I was talking about Joseph. <laughs> Joseph is one of Jacob's 12 sons. And God gives Joseph, when he's 17 years old, a vision. We'll pick up the story in Genesis 37, verse 1. Now, Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the story. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilah, Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. And now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of the old age. Also, he made a tunic of many colors, but when his brother saw that their brother loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and they could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. 
There we were, binding sheaves in the field. When, behold, my sheave rose also, stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. And then he dreamed still another dream. And he told it to his brothers and he said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him. And he said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Now we know that throughout the book of Genesis, Jacob comes to the realization that God is in control of his life. And although his brothers are envious of this, Jacob keeps in mind, or Jacob keeps this in mind because he knows that visions and dreams may come from God. He had one himself a number of chapters ago when he was, when he saw the ladder of God, the angels going up and down. When he understood that God speaks that way, he's wondering this issue. Now, well, let's take a look at Joseph. Joseph is almost the least of his brothers. There's one, Benjamin, who's a little younger than he is. Uh, but for this point, in this culture, Joseph is the least. And the least never overrides the, the, the firstborn. And so they hate him. They hate him because he came. Well, his mother was not the same as their mother's. And they have this, they, they have this hatred for him because Jacob shows favoritism to him. And God gives him this vision of the future. It turns out that this vision is going to happen perfectly as it is listed here. That later on when Joseph takes the reins in Egypt, they all bow down to him. Not understanding that it is their brother. But God has a plan and he has allowed that plan to be cleared by Joseph. But Joseph needs to be seasoned in the fire. He's not in a place. He's bragging to his brothers about these dreams. This is a heart that God cannot have. So what happens is, is Joseph goes out to see what his brothers are doing, and they conspire against him, and they sell him to the Midianites. And he is sold. It says in verse 28 of chapter 37, the Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. They get rid of him. They lay to Jacob. They say, oh my gosh, I think an animal ate Jacob, Jacob uh, ate Joseph, and Joseph is dead. He goes into a great depression, Jacob does. But Joseph is now been sold. So he has been reduced in his situation. He is now not no longer the highly praised by his father in the midst of living a free life in his land with his people and his family. He's now been sold as a slave to these Ishmaelite, Midianite traders that have come by. He has been reduced and he's left to wonder what's going on. Then we know, we find out that in, in verse 39, uh, chapter 39 of Genesis, verse 1, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. And then he made him overseer of his house. And all that he had, he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread in which he ate. 
So Joseph gets sold to the to the Egyptian Potiphar, and Potiphar is the position of like a police chief of the poli of the of the royal guard in uh, to Pharaoh. So he's high ranking official, and Joseph is sold into slavery. Now that's being reduced again because now he is not in his own people. He's not in his own land. He's been sold into slavery for this man, and now we can find ourselves being reduced. God is taking down that clay. It's been marred in his hand and it needs to take it back down and rebuild it another way. He needs to make him, he needs to form him and shape him and refine him in the fire so that he can be the man who can stand in the midst of these two visions that he gave him. A man that his brothers and his father and mother bow down to because we find out that God has a plan for Joseph that is far beyond his ability to imagine. Yet he's being reduced at this point. And now he's this, well, now he's a slave. But something to realize here as it's speaking through this story that God is with him. That even though he's being reduced and he's not who he was and he's not where he was and he's not who he wants to be, God is with him and blessing him all over the place to the point where Potiphar gives him all, he gives him complete control of his entire house. Potiphar doesn't have to worry about anything but what he's going to eat for dinner. God's still working. God's still blessing. God's still showing his faithfulness, and it's keeping Joseph faithful to God. That's the whole point here, is even though Joseph has been reduced, he's still patiently seeking God, and God is taking care of him in this place. Now, I want you to see something here. His wife comes, Potiphar's wife comes against him, wants him to have a relation with him, wants to sleep with him, and he is a man of good character. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. Now then, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day, and he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. Now Joseph, on the, on the top of this picture, is being a man of God, and he's not falling for this ruse, and he's not falling into temptation. No doubt Potiphar's wife is beautiful, and Joseph's a good-looking guy. But he doesn't fall into it. But the point I want to show you is, is that the fact that he's still kind of gloating in his position here. He's like, look, there's no one better in this house than I am, other than my master. He hasn't withheld any. I am pretty special here. Oh, God needs a little bit more reducing. Remember, Moses had a lot of pride. He was chased into the wilderness. For 40 years, he had pride living as in an Egyptian. Then for 40 years, he was on the backside of a desert by himself, speaking to himself and his sheep as he's out in the middle of the backside of the desert, the backside of the desert university for living and realizing and understanding how to become humble. And then God calls him at the right time when he's humble. So much so that God, that Moses even argues with God. It's like, I don't speak well. I can't talk. I don't, I'm not eloquent. I'm, I'm a problem. I'm not, I'm not good for this. You need to find someone else. And we find out later in his life in Exodus that God refers to Moses as being the most humble man in the world. The one that he speaks to like a friend. The only man who's ever spoken to God that way. Joseph, if he's going to raise to some sort of fame and some sort of interesting position God has for him, he's going to need to be reduced again. And that's what happens. Because his wife catches him. Potiphar's wife catches him, tries to get him, tries to seduce him. He says no. She grabs him by the tunic that he's wearing. It pulls off. He leaves naked. He runs away. He doesn't do anything. And she lies to Potiphar that he tried to come in and rape her. And they throw him in jail. 
verse 19, chapter 39, verse 19. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, and after, after this manner, said his anger was aroused. And then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, no doubt a pit, very dark, very yucky, very hard place to be. He was there in prison. Uh, but the Lord was with Joseph, and he showed his mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority, because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Well, wait a minute. Joseph's been reduced again. Now he's not doesn't have the freedom of being in the house and doing all the things for Potiphar. Now he's been elite. He's been he's been unethically charged with a crime he didn't commit and thrown into jail. And now he's in jail. He's been reduced. He is now a prisoner. He's not a he's not a <laughs> he's not a he's not a slave. He's a prisoner now. But yet God is with him. He's teaching him administration administrative duties, keeping track of what people are doing, a leadership position that's needed here pretty soon when he's, when he's immediately out of the blue, raised up into a position of power. What I want you to see is, is even though he's being reduced and being reduced and being reduced and being reduced, God is with him, blessing him and blessing him and blessing him and blessing him. There's a lot of people who think, okay, well... Uh, if this is all happening to me, I'm being punished by God. No, not necessarily. Sometimes it's a refining storm that comes along. It's a storm that makes us work on the fact that we need to be reduced and humbled so that we can be built up, built up, built up into a vessel that he needs us for the next season. And it's possible that God will build you up for a season and break you and build you up again differently for another season. Everything he does is good is for the good. And we need to remember that. That even in our sufferings and our struggles and our difficulties, even when the things that we seek and we desire are starting to be taken away, we're finding ourselves being molded in the shape of God. Made better. I want to stop at this point and I want to read to you this letter from from Francois Fenelon in his book, Let Go. It's letter 27. The time of temptation and distress is no time to form resolves. Your excessive distress is like a summer torrent, which must be suffered to run away. Nothing makes any impression upon you. And you think you have the most substantial evidence for the most imaginary states. It is the ordinary result of great, sac of great suffering. That's, he says, I, man, your suffering is horrible. It's coming against you really hard. You're being reduced in yourself. You're being humbled, broken down, brought to this place. And if you're not careful, you're going to make silly decisions based on this. You're imagining one thing that's not true. But we tend to do that when we suffer. When we suffer, we get a little bit emotional and we start to see things that aren't there. We start to see truths that aren't real. If we forget that God is working all the time, that he doesn't leave us or forsake us, if we forget, then we start to think that maybe he's mad at us or he's left. And that's why we're having hardships. Nobody said in the Bible that following Christianity was going to be easy or that it was going to be, that it was going to be fun. It's difficult. It's difficult to be a Christian man in this day and age. But God is with us and he's forming us and shaping us. And, and if all good things, if no good thing is withheld from them who watch up, uprightly, then even the hard stuff is good because it has a reason. Remember, is, is the fainting in the weakness, can that be a good thing? So that we can shore up and patch the holes in the weaknesses in our faith and stand alone. Fenelon's going to talk about that as he continues. A little further down, it says, God will be glorified in your heart if, 
you will be faithful in yielding to his designs. But nothing would be more injudicious than the forming of resolutions in a state of distress, which is manifestly accompanied by an inability to do anything according to God. When you shall have become calm, then do in a spirit of recollection that you shall perceive to be nearest the will of God respecting you. He's saying, he's saying God's going to do what he needs to do if you, res- if you don't resist his designs. If he's breaking you down in pieces, that means there's a design for something else to make you into a different vessel. You have to let him. But here's the thing. Don't make any crazy decisions about it while you're still emotional. We know that the minute emotions get involved, our intellect, our, our reasoning skills go out the door. When, a, when a, an argument between with you and your spouse get emotional, there's no fixing it until you guys calm down. That's because once we get emotional, we don't see rationalizing. It turns off the our ability to rationalize in our brain and we go into that fight or flight place where it's all emotional and it's all angry and spouting and crying and hard stuff. We need to stand even to make decisions about God when we calm down and we read and meditate and pray and let that still small voice come to us. We have to see that the bush is burning and that it's out of character, that it's weird, and that we go and check it out. But the minute we get all kinds of emotional, the, the bush is burning, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna run around with like my hair is on fire, and I'm gonna panic. That fennelin is like, look, you need to listen to what God's going to say, going to say. But you need to calm down first because all this distresses is only building up in your mind these these truths that aren't real. And you're going to need to come to a place where you can you can kind of stop and take a deep breath and see what really is going on. He continues, commune and listen to God and be deaf to self. And then do all that is in your heart. For I have no fear that a spirit of that sort will permit you to take any wrong step. He says, when you calm down, be deaf to your own mind. And really, it's a good idea to be somewhat deaf to the people around you, unless you have good counsel. We need to seek God first and understand what he's doing. When we understand God's plan, he will not lead us into danger. He won't lead us into difficulty. He won't lead us into a situation that's going to hurt us. We can trust his direction, but we need to be calm enough and reserved enough to understand. And this takes practice. This is a weakness that will make you faint in the day of adversity. How we grow in ourselves when adversities and difficulties difficulties become harder is maturing in our faith. Suppress that we, uh, but to suppose that we are sane when we are in a very agony of distress and under the influence of a violent temptation of self love, excuse me, is to ensure our being led astray. Hey, you get emotional and you get into yourself and you start listening to your own feelings and your own emotions in the midst of distress, you are guaranteed to be led astray. Because remember, the enemy is standing over your shoulder questioning your Christianity, questioning whether you're saved, questioning whether you're a good Christian, questioning whether all of this is coming against you because you have failed God, questioning or, or concerning, right? J- um, Satan always has a boat waiting for you. Just ask Jonah. <clears throat> the readiest way to self-deception is to trust in ourselves in a state of suffering in which nature is so unreasonable and irritated. And Fenelon finishes, it says, Wait then until you shall be in a condition to be advised, to enjoy the true advantages of illumination. We must be equally ready for every alternative 
and must have nothing which we are not cheerfully disposed at once to sacrifice for his sake. Fenelon is like, look, just calm yourself down, slow yourself down, bring your emotions down. All this stuff that's happening to you has a reason. Be logical about that idea and have faith in what God is doing. And when those days come, when that time comes, make sure you're ready to give everything over to the design of God and put yourself away. In essence, die to yourself, take up your cross and follow God. These can be these holes in our faith can be over can be found when we faint in a day of adversity and we can stand up and say, Holy cow, what just happened? This is what I need to know. Let's go back and find Joseph. Joseph's now in jail. He's been reduced and been reduced and been reduced, and now he's sitting in jail. God is with him, blessings are happening, but he's in jail. And we see here that while he's in jail, these two officers of the court, the butler and the uh, baker, both come in and they both have dreams. And we find out in verse 8 of chapter 40 of Genesis that it says, And they said to him, We have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And so Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell them to me, please. He is now still working. Joseph hasn't turned his life against God. He hasn't gotten emotional in the midst of all of this and started making decisions in his own heart that he needs to turn against God because God has left him. No, he is in a time of adversity, but he's standing on God's promises even when he's been reduced to ashes. Ashes. And unfortunately, at this point, you think it couldn't get worse, it will. So they, they both tell him the dream, and he tells, he interprets the dreams beautifully. In verse 12, it says, Just Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. And now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But, verse 14, remember me. When it, will, when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here, and they should be put into the dungeons. He says, here's the interpretation. When it comes true, you'll be lifted back up to Pharaoh. But tell Pharaoh that I'm here. Will you please get me out of here? I have no reason to be here. I have no reason to be here. Well, as we get to the last verse in chapter 40, it says, Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but he forgot him. So from the time that he has these dreams at 17 years old, he's going to be released at 30. It's been a long road of being reduced and being reduced and being humbled. He's being blessed in all kinds of ways, given administrative skills that God needs him to have. He's, God's doing all kinds of things, but where is Joseph's heart. And where should our heart be when we start getting reduced? Where am I when all of this I trained for for so long had become a way of life for me and yet God has reduced me and then reduced me and then reduced me again and reduced me again and reduced me down to the ashes of what I was? What can I be when I can't be what I was? Well, there comes a time here in chapter 41 when Pharaoh has a dream. Now we believe that he was in jail a couple more years for this, before this happened. It says in verse 9 of chapter 41, Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day when Pharaoh was angry with his servant and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. Both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream one night at he and I, and each of us dreaming according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with, uh, with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and he told him, he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream, and it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us. So it happened. He restored me to my office, and, he hang and you hanged him. And verse 14 says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved changed his clothes, and came to Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one here who can interpret it, but I have heard it said, 
of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. And so Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now it's been years. Every day, get up, do your thing, go to bed, get up every day, go to bed, get up every day, go to bed. Unbeknownst to Joseph, as he's doing this in jail, he's a captive, he is a captive member of this lifestyle. He doesn't have a lot of freedom as he's sitting in jail. Something is happening behind the scenes. Pharaoh has this dream. God is working. The dream Pharaoh has was sent by God. And Pharaoh, this man remembers Joseph. This uh, The butler remembers Joseph. He's like, oh man, I just... Joseph asked me to remember him. I forgot him. A couple years goes by. And how quickly Joseph's life changes. He got up one morning, did doing whatever, another regular day. And they came down, they shaved his, shaved his head and gave him... Uh, brand new clothes, and then they placed him in front of the most powerful man in the world at the time, Pharaoh. And he says, hey, I heard that you can hear this, this, uh, this dream. I heard you can understand this dream. He says, no, God can. He still pays tribute to God. It is God who does this. It is not me. God, in, in, in his reducing, Joseph has not turned his back on God. He has been blessed. He has seen blessed because he has continued to walk this path. Even when he doesn't understand it, even when he doesn't care to be there, even when he's been reduced to ashes, even when he's sitting in a, in a dark and murky dungeon and he doesn't know these, these reasons for this, God has been preparing him for this moment and pharaoh gives the dream and joseph interprets it perfectly and in chapter 41 verse 37 it says so the advice was good in the eyes of pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants and pharaoh said to his servants can we find such a one as this a man in whom is the spirit of god what this is Egypt. Egypt has thousands of gods, and he's talking about the spirit of the living God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Pharaoh is handing power over to a man who is drawn and directed by the one true God. That's fascinating. And we see that happen with Nebuchadnezzar as well. The Babylonians didn't, didn't trust God, but after Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he gave honor to the God of the Bible. That shows you that there is something in our hearts that tells us that there is a creator, that we were created in his image. That Romans chapter 1 isn't just lip service, that it tells us, hey, hey, the, the evidence of God is clearly manifested all around our lifestyle and in ourself, that we know that there's a realism, that we know that God exists. The only problem is, is we want to be our own God, so we kind of suppress that idea in unrighteousness. And that leads us down a place of idolatry where we make up our own gods. Egypt was a a pagan nation that did that, but yet Pharaoh sees the value of a Hebrew man who, who has the ability to tell him what's going to happen to the God of the Bible. That's, a, that's, that's amazing. Verse 39, when Pharaoh said to Joseph, insomuch as God has shown you all of this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all of the land of Egypt. <laughs> and then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it in Joseph's hands. And he clothed him with the garments and fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all of the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphna Paanaea, 
and he gave him a wife named Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all of the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Well, if you keep reading, all of what he has done here administratively saves the kingdom, saves his family, saves the Hebrew nation because of a famine. And they start to live in Egypt. Now Jacob dies. And now Joseph's brothers are worried that now that Jacob is dead, that Joseph is going to is take out his, he's going to, you know, he's going to bring his wrath upon his brothers for doing what they had done. It was wickedness to sell them to Ish, the Ishmaelites. They have no idea how, how God worked. They have no idea about how Joseph makes it to number two in, in Egypt from the time that they sold him as a slave to these traders going by. But God works in mysterious and crazy, amazingly powerful ways. If you let him, if you don't get yourself caught up in the emotions of what they're doing, but you just let God work, you're going to find out that all things work out for the good. So by the time we get to Genesis chapter 50, in verse 18, it says, Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as this day and in this day to save many people alive. So now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and he spoke to them kindly. See, when, when we get reduced and we get reduced and we get reduced and we get changed and we think there's a plan, but the plan changes because that's not what God had for us. We could do one of two things. We can get ourselves carried away by why on earth we're being punished for changing, or we can sit back and say, God has a plan. This is meant for good. And I don't know what it is. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why he continues to do this, except but he's humbling me for something different and something better. He has smashed down this clay that he had made into this first vessel, and I'm being shaped into a different vessel for a different purpose and a different reason. I either have to, to revel in the fact that I miss my old life, or I need to be expected to stand up and stop listening to myself and listen for God's voice. Because at one day, one time soon, I'm going to be, it's going to be a normal day. And all of a sudden, I'm going to be in the middle of something that God wanted me to be in the middle of. <clears throat> I want to show you an interesting story in the New Testament. And it, it's an easy, it's an interesting story because in the midst of being thinking you've been made for one thing and yet being changed and made because God has a different plan for you is at the very center of one of the apostles. Now, it says in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, now it came to pass in those days that Jesus went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, the brothers, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot. Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. And I want to tell you about a man named Simon called the Zealot. Now, Simon is known as Simon the Zealot here in, Ch in Luke, and then also in the book of Acts, in, in Acts chapter 1, both of which being written by Dr. Luke. A man who is very, very, um, very meticulous in his details. He's also known as Judas, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Simon the Canaanite 
in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. But we don't read anything about Simon called the Zealot anywhere in the Gospels. He does nothing. So why is this man so important to me at this point in my career and in my life? Well, we know something very specific about Simon just simply knowing that he is a zealot. Now, who are the zealots? Well, after Rome kind of came in and took over, uh, excuse me, not Rome, uh, Greece. When Greece came in, Alexander the Great took over Israel. And then after Alexander the Great died, they was broken into four nations. And a, a couple of rounds of leaders away came a man named Antiochus Epiphanes. He's the man who walked into the temple and degraded the temple. The, the desolation, the abomination of desolation that Daniel speaks about in the foreground was, it was him. In the later ground is going to be refulfilled a second time by the Antichrist. This is why preterists believe that all of the prophecy in the Bible was carried out in 70 AD. was because everything has happened at least one time. But Jesus tells us after Antiochus Epiphanes that there's going to be a, an abomination of desolation. Jesus himself said that there's going to be a second fulfillment of that Any, anyway. Antiochus Epiphany comes in. Well, there is a group, a band of men called the Maccabees. They were Jews. They were military men who decided to overthrow Antiochus Epiphanes. And what they did, God with with God's hand, is is they went in and they overthrew Rome and they took, or they overthrew Greece and they took back the temple and they re they refixed the temple, got the temple all fixed up and ready to go again and all that stuff. Well, those Maccabees, you can read that in the Apocrypha in a couple of books called the Maccabees, I think one and two. There may even be a third one. But in that 400 years between Malachi and the birth of Jesus Christ, there was this up, 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 this kind of overthrow. These men were kind of special forces CIA type of people. They were trained in war, trained in destabilization, and trained and overzealous to, to, to instruct and to fulfill and to uh, interpret the law of God. So when Rome came around, zealots were trying to... You know, they were they were training underground and they were trying to assassinate leaders and people, public officials of Rome and trying to create an overthrow. There's a good bet that Barabbas was probably a zealot. If we read in the at the end of the book of Luke, when they're having this discussion about who to who to let go, whether it was Jesus or Barabbas, it says here in Luke chapter twenty three. Uh, 23 verse 18, they all cried once and saying, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. He was most likely a zealot. And here is Jesus calling Simon a zealot to his apostles. Now, it was well understood that Rome was going to be, they thought the Messiah was going to come and overthrow Rome. So that their humanly lifestyle could continue in Judaism without oppression of an oppressor like Rome. But that's not what Jesus came to do. So if Jesus calls a man who is trained in modern guerrilla warfare and tactics, destabilizations of, and he calls him to himself, and Simon says, "Well, I'm at your, you know, I'm a, I'm a soldier. I'm ready to overthrow Rome because you're the Messiah. Because I come to believe that you're the Messiah, and I'm here." Jesus has got to say, "That's, that's not your, that's not your mission. I'm not calling you for that mission. I'm calling you to be a fisher of men." I'm calling you to my mission. And all of a sudden, all these years of training that Simon has been doing as a zealot is now kind of left out there. What, what, what is he now? Well, I, I can't, be, I'm not, I'm not the protector, police officer, hero that I thought at one point in my life, God made me to be. He, no, he, he, he didn't. He didn't. And I have to get rid of that idea because if I hold on to my pride 
and I hold on to my arrogance in the midst of that, that identity that I have built over the last two decades, then in my suffering, I'm not going to hear what God has to do. I need to calm myself down and be rational about what God is doing. Think about Joseph being reduced and being reduced and being reduced and being taken down to the very stick so that God can rebuild my house in a different way, rebuild my vessel in a way that is pleasing to him. What is it that's coming next? I, I don't know, but it's exciting. We can close in Paul's words because in 2 Corinthians chapter <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul totally understands all of this. He was, he was a zealous man who thought his job was to, to enforce the law, but then, but then God, Jesus knocks him off his donkey and tells him, that's not your mission. Your mission is different. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to put you in a position physically where you can't do what you think you should be doing. Chapter 12, verse 7. By the way, after chapter 12, verse 1, 1 to 6, when, when Paul sees a vision of heaven, in verse 7, we see what God had to what Jesus had to do with Paul to keep him humble. It says, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. But what's interesting in this whole thing, and I've covered this in other teachings just recently, but in verse 9, Paul says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I understand what that means now because when I can't do it on my own and I can't be what I was, so what do, what do I become when I can't be what I was? That I have to lean on Christ to do because I, there are things I can't do. There are things in my heart I want to be, but I can't be. And anytime I thought that maybe it was going to change and I could go back to that place, God has made it very clear by reducing me even a more that it's not an option. But what does God have for me? It's easy to get all kind of get yourself all emotionally upended if you're not careful because these things are hard. They're heavy when you have an identity crisis and you've come to this changing when God has knocked you down and brought you to this the bottom of this. But I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 as I close. It says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Remember that God is making us, an, making us a, a, a vessel, a vessel by which we can put the power of God within it. Remember, it brings that potter's idea to something beautiful because he's making this pot up to something he wants it to be. God is making us a pot and a pot is made of clay and dust and dirt. And so are we. But what do we fill that pot with? The power and the spirit of God? Or is it all about us and our feelings and our emotions and who we are? Are we trying to bend God to who we want, he, we want him to be to us? Or are we bending to him? It says that, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power of God may be, it may be of, of God and not of us. We need God to fill that pot, not ourselves. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Jesus Christ. This is These are humble words. A man's like, look, it's really hard, but I'm not obliterated. Because God is using those things to knock us down, build us up, make it big and wide so we can put all the power of God inside it and we can walk around in our difficulties and splash that brilliance and power and loving grace and glory of God's spirit all over the people that we meet. That's our testimony and our witness. What can we be when we can't be what we used to be? what we can't be what we were 
And if God doesn't withhold any good thing, is it possible that when we faint due to adversity and our, we find out and learn that our strength is weak, that it's, it's light, we, have, we don't have strength to handle the adversity, therefore we faint, is, it, is that a good thing so that we can be ready to build in us a strength leaning on God's grace because it's sufficient for us in a time of need? I hope this is something that you chew on that it brings your heart to a place of understanding that even in these difficult times that we're living in, when it seems like he's just randing on, he's just smashing us into bits, that God's heart isn't to smash us to bits. It's simply to build us up into a better vessel. Go in peace and be blessed.